last time we um, we talked about uh, diagnostic tests and we talked about we covered um, autocorrelation we covered heteroscedasticity and the specification errors uh, today uh, we'll start our first lecture on uh, time series econometrics we'll cover dynamic models and stationarity we'll learn what that means and why that is important for time series uh, data and time series regression but as usual before we start I would like to look at your um, feedback from the previous lecture from last week. Shh. Yes, that's better. Okay, so last, last week was um, rated by you 4.1. Seems that so many people didn't like the lecture since the one before was 4.6 or 4.5. So we're not going to the right direction. <laughs> but um, I've got some nice comments from your side. People, some people like the lecture. They said it's, um, uh, they like the recap we do in the beginning. They say it's easy to understand, well explained, interactive, engaging, not boring, nice things said about the slides, all that kind of uh, positive uh, comments. That's great. But th also there are a few of you who put some comments about things that they uh, would like to change. People think, some said I was a bit too fast at the end. Again, please slow me down when I go too fast. Uh, difficult material, couldn't follow lecturer, too many formulas didn't have fundamental of econometrics, so it was difficult to understand uh, theory. That's understandable. So if, you are, if you're not confident with econometrics or if you haven't um, studied econometrics in the past, I just want to tell you that I don't make uh, the assumption that you understand or you covered econometrics. Obviously, it will be a bonus if you have done so. But I try to simplify things as much as I can. However, I'm really happy to go and repeat things again and go through things again. And I, I'm happy to produce extra material if you want to. It could be outside the lecture at all. So I, I'm happy to produce any number of videos covering anything that you think it's difficult to understand. So I think it would be helpful for me um, to address this comment if people say, well, I didn't really understand heteroscedasticity, what, that, what it means, or I didn't understand how to apply brush pick and test. Could you please um, explain that again? So if that would be more helpful, because that in that way I can, I can kind of address the comment. But if your comment is very general like this, sometimes, okay, I'll try my best, but maybe I'm just doing something not in the right direction. And I would really prefer if you really tell me what exactly you didn't understand and I'll be happy to go through it even one-to-one -one if you want to come to my office forget about recording more videos even if you want to come to my office please come come to uh, the office hours outside of office hours if, I, if I'm in the office just pop in okay tell me this is I didn't understand this part could you please explain it again and I'm 100% happy with that so I don't really mind I have no issues with repeating things giving different examples more examples explain the same thing in different ways even go back to very basic stuff that I may might have assumed that you you are familiar with okay so please um, as I said I don't I don't take the these comments personal actually I, I do appreciate these comments because it's helped me to 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 see where you are how much you are uh, getting from the material and what do I need to do to improve this, okay? So please keep commenting on the teaching, commenting on the lectures, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. That actually helps, okay? So, and as I said, one way to deal with this, I could post more material, recorded material. I have, I can also 
do one to one if you want to. Just come to my office. Uh, if you want to bring your friends with you, th that's fine. So it uh, doesn't mean that you have to come one to one. But my point is, even if I have to say things one to one, so please come to my office and I'll be happy to, uh, to go through these uh, uh, points. Um, just as a quick recap of the last lecture, we talked about heteroscedasticity. What is heteroscedasticity? What is the problem when we have heteroscedasticity? What are the consequences for all this estimation when we have heteroscedasticity? How to deal with heteroscedasticity? Do you remember what is heteroscedasticity? Can you now say heteroscedasticity? Well, it took me time to, <laughs> to get used to it. <laughs> Okay, I'm not asking you to repeat it, it's fine. You're trying, I see like people trying to say it. So heteroscedasticity happens, or heteroscedastic error means that you don't have, the error term doesn't have constant variance. And this is the assum assumption number four. We made, um, in our model, you remember the first lecture, we made seven assumptions, and we said we, since these are assumptions, we need really to test whether they are true or not. So one of which was, um, assumption four about heteroscedasticity about the uh, the um, variance of the error term and what we'd like to see is a homoscedastic or equal variance um, error term. That's wh when we give it this annotation sigma square, so it's constant variance. But this is unlikely the case with cross section data, and we explain why it is unlikely with cross section. But in all cases, you need to test for that uh, formally. Uh, but in cross-section data, usually it depends on I, so that means it's not it's not constant. Then we explain that okay, with all this estimation, all this remain unbiased, consistent, which are which are good properties that we want. These are desirable properties for our estimator, but less efficient, so they are no longer blue. Okay, it's not the best anymore. Okay, and that is the the, the problem. And obviously, uh, that um, put the standard errors into question and any inference based on that is questionable as well because we can't trust the standard errors. Um, one way to, to, do to uh, detect for heteroscedasticity is to plot the residuals or you could uh, apply the bush bigan test uh, or white test and both follow the same, has the same um, uh, null hypothesis, uh, homoscedastic error term. So if you have a small p-value, you reject small, when I say small here, I compare with a significance level, let's say 5% or 1%, so if you have a s small p-value, that, that means you reject the null hypothesis, that means your uh, errors are not uh, homoscedastic, they are heteroscedastic. And then we, we, we explain how we could, uh, if we apply the heteroscedasticity consistent uh, standard errors, that will correct the standard errors, so the estimated coefficients remain the same, but what has changed, if if you remember from the example we gave last time, was the standard errors mainly. So we've got the same coefficient, but different standard error, which were corrected for taking into account uh, heteroscedasticity. Then we move to autocorrelation. We, we discuss again, this was assumption number five we made, um, the covariance between um, UI and UJ, so any two error errors should be zero, and this is unlikely with time series data. So when, when you deal with time series data, so you should expect autocorrelation or your errors to be serially correlated. And again, similarly here we have a b unbiased estimator, consistent estimator, but uh, no longer uh, um, the efficient one or the best one. You still can uh, plot the your residuals the same way to, to see if there's any pattern. And if that's the case, then you should suspect the uh, presence of autocorrelation and you could use uh, Durbin Watson test, and we explain what assumptions, the assumptions under which you can uh, apply Durbin Watson test, and uh, or Brush Began, uh, uh, sorry, Brush Goodfry LM test, and how to correct for that. We this is what we did last time. We we um, we applied the um, this procedure, the heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent standard errors. Okay, hack that's for short. So H. HAC, that's what we did in the lecture, but also we said we could introduce lags, and this is something we will do today. Okay, we'll show you how we can um, introduce lag into the model uh, uh, that includes uh, time series uh, data. Um, and then finally, we move to um, specification errors. 
And when we talk about specification errors, again, the assumptions number, the assumption number 7A7 we made is that the model is correctly specified. And when we talk about the specification of the model, we, we, we talk about many things, but before we jump into explaining what that is, we explain that there is no such a perfect model. So always you need to compare between different specification and see which one uh, that sounds uh, the best one or the, the, the correct one, but there's no such perfect model anyway. But anyway, so we w the, the, the cases we discussed, we when we have underfitted model where you, for some reason, uh, dropped important variables and the effect of these important variables um, will cause this issue of uh, omitted variable bias and we explain that the issue here is very serious because the estimation or the estimator will be biased. Do you remember when when we give the example about family income and we said if family income depends on house husband education and wife education and number of kids less than six years old and then for some reason we drop two of the variables and we just run a regression of family income on uh, husband uh, education okay and we show that the coefficients are are different and that that you overestimate the 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 fact of the house uh, of the husband um, education on family income because you omitted the other two important variables okay which we assume that they are important but anyway so that uh, also in the other case the overfitted models when you include irrelevant uh, variables into the model so some variables for some reasons some people think when you they have higher r squares so that's a better model that's why they think okay if i add one or two more variables that uh, improve or, or increase the uh, the value of r squares so that might be better in the same time that these variables are not actually relevant and we did some exercise last time we included in our uh, model two variables that they just created independently they're not actually related to family income at all and we saw that this was uh, how this would affect the, the estimation and also um, this includes the in incorrect functional form we discuss uh, the case, what we mean by linearity, you remember in lecture two, so we didn't cover it last lecture, but we covered this in lecture two, and we talked about um, your model could be linear in, um, as long as it is linear in parameter, you still can use O less, but the, the, the functional form can be different, or the, the, the it doesn't necessarily have to be linear in variables, so the variables could be uh, nonlinear. Um, so whatever that is, so that means you need to make sure that you're following um, um, the correct functional form. And, and one way, one really good way to do this is just to plot your uh, dependent variable and see um, uh, maybe if there's any button can tell you uh, the right or the um, something about the, the functional form. Measurement errors, we explain what would happen if the measurement errors in Y, in the dependent variable, and what would happen if the measurement errors happen in one of your uh, x's or one of your independent variables. So that was um, the recap from last uh, last week. The lecture recording now is online, so you can watch it again. And I'm hoping by recording all lectures, see, it's a camera here, there's another camera on the other side, there's a mic, so I'm trying to uh, have a, a really good quality video so you can uh, go over the material again and again. Uh, so if you think the, the parts of the lecture that were not very clear or something very difficult, then you have no excuse. You can go back and see the lecture again and again and again until you just you feel like you get enough of me. So <laughs> just <laughs> turn your laptop off. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the, as we said, we follow flip tutorial, so you have to watch the video before this tutorial. So we have a computer lab, so before the computer lab you need to watch this. So in the videos I record now, I show you how to produce exactly the same uh, graphs, the same results, the same tables you see in my slides. So you should be able to uh, reproduce exactly the same, uh, the same uh, stuff you see here. In this lecture, as I said, this is the first lecture uh, on time series. Econometrics. So we started with, um, you still can relate it to what we covered last week about autocorrelation because it's, uh, it's very related to time series anyway. 
Uh, but what we will cover today is dynamic models when we talk about introducing uh, lags. Uh, so we'll cover auto uh, regressive models, distributed lag models, and ARDEL or auto regressive distributed lag models. And then we'll explain what we mean by stationarity and how to test for that. So if you cover these two points, that'd be great. Um, and hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will um, you will understand what that means. Um, so please go on Socrative and answer the first two questions. The first three questions. Uh, make sure when you enter your name, uh, please put your student number. So if you don't want to put your name, that's fine. At least you put student. As I said, we start with autoregressive models, and what that means. Uh, if we have AR process, meaning that your variable, remember we have time series data, we talk about time series data now. So you have your um, dependent variable, y, in time t, depends on itself in time t minus 1. So if you talk about growth rate, let's say this quarter, depends on the growth rate in the previous quarter and in the previous quarter and then you can go back in time p times or p lags okay and of course plus some some error term okay so when we talk about autoregressive process or ar process usually arp p here is the number of uh, the lags how many lags or how many uh, 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 time periods you go back in time uh, in this example, you could go to P. This is example about the US GDP AR2 model, meaning that the growth rate this quarter, if this is quarter of the data, depends on the growth rate in the previous quarter and the growth rate in two quarters back, okay? Plus some, some error term, okay? Um, and this is the estimation of the model. So we, we have data for this, for growth rate, the US uh, GDP growth. And when we estimated this model, this is AR model, you see auto regressive model. So auto it regress, you regress the variable on itself in the past. So GT regressed on GT minus one and GT minus two. So it's the same variable, but in the past. So in this case, uh, when we um, used OCAN data set, you have access to the data set now in R, so you can replicate exactly the same, uh, the same results, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post the, a video to, to show you how to replicate, how to reproduce the same table exactly. So what we have here, we have an intercept. This is delta, the estimation for delta, this is the coefficient, and this one is the first lag, and this one is the second lag, okay? So this is the first lag, gt minus one, and this is the coefficient for the second lag, gt minus, uh, minus two. And it seems that both are statistically significant since that we have small p-value, it's smaller than 1% uh, uh, in this case and uh, smaller than 5% in the other case. So that means it could be important to include or to consider when you talk about um, time series to consider the lags. Remember, one of the one of the ways that you could get rid of or correct for um, autocorrelation is to include lags. Because this information, if it is not included s um, explicitly in the model, where the effect of these lags will go to? Yes, the error. And if it goes in the errors, that makes the error serially correlated. Okay, so taking this back here, put them, taking them away or out of the error putting them explicitly in the model that means that it's not longer so uh, serially correlated okay so that can help with autocorrelation issue as well okay so introducing lags could be one of the important issues with um, uh, dealing with autocorrelation with time series data and it makes sense because if you think about it um, if you have high unemployment rate in the previous on previous quarter so it's likely that you're going to have high employment rate this quarter as well or if you have high growth rate the previous quarter so the chances that you will have uh, a high growth rate again might be very high so this sort of um, uh, 
trend that you see in the data and in time series data so sometimes you see upward trend or downward trend i know sometimes the, s uh, the, the, the series go up and down but in in, in two uh, consecutive periods so the chances they actually fall on the same trend uh, are much more but in that case okay so in our case here it seems to be important to consider uh, the first lag and the second lag because both are statistically significant when explaining GDB growth in time t on this quarter. So, how many lags to go back in time? Because in this example, okay, in this example, we consider only two lags. Why should we go back only two lags? Why not four lags? Why not three lags? Why not 10 lags? Why not 12 lags? So why should we go only two lags? So there must be a reason uh, for how many lags to include in the model. And this could be either, uh, mainly most people rely on some information criteria. So uh, they just um, use one of these criteria. Um, the archaic information criteria. So these are different lags. So this is the same model, but with different lags, so with only one lag, two lags, three lags, up to five lags, and then you choose the number of lags that we minimize, will we have the minimum for this minimum value for these criteria, okay? So according to this one, so the first criteria, so four lags should be included because this is the smallest number. According to this, might not be the same, it's actually, it's the second, yeah, so it's two lags, okay? So sometimes, People come to me and say, well, actually there are more information criteria, not just these two. So you can, if, if you do this in eViews, it produces like five, six uh, table full of criteria and, and sometimes you have conflicting results. So you, st you, you need to your, your own judgment in this case. And I personally would do, um, I will use the number of lags that will eliminate serial correlation, autocorrelation. So uh, after I estimate the model, let's say I think it's two lags, and then I estimate the model, and then I test for serial autocorrelation. If I have serial autocorrelation, that means I need to include more lags, okay? If I find uh, no serial correlation, it might not still make sense to me because I'll tell you why. If this is quarterly data, and I see like only two lags were enough to eliminate serial correlation, I still worry about seasonal effect. So what if this data was, let's say, if there's some seasonal effect means that I need to go back four quarters, not just two quarters. So sometimes I even go beyond what this criteria suggests if I feel like, okay, there's a reason to do that. Okay, and of course you need your own judgment about the, um, the results you obtain as well. Does it really make more sense to go back more lags or not. But let's say, okay, the first step is to check this uh, information criteria and then you choose the, the one, the, the number of lags that um, give you the minimum value for this criteria. Some other people, some people would look at the choreogram of the residual from the estimated model and see whether these bars go above these. So in that case, you know, you remember from last time, each one of these represent one of the lags, okay? And in that case, seems we really need to go back in time so many lags because one of them is just going uh, outside these, these borders, okay? So as I said, it sometimes it is down to your own uh, judgment, but you still need to think about what the criteria suggest. Uh, what if these all these criteria suggest only uh, um, the same uh, uh, lag length. So it, it must be some reason in the data that actually show this. But anyway, oh if you have, if I have, let's say, monthly data, and you say I'm using, um, I, I estimated the model, and, and I include only one lag, I'll be surprised if there's no serial correlation. Okay? So, so it depends on really the, the, the frequency of your data as well is important, okay? So quarterly data, if you have annually data and 
you included one lag, I would understand it might okay there might be no reason like no reason to go back more than one year, okay, because maybe if there's any seasonal effect or anything that okay would be backed up from last year, um, so it might be some I, I might understand that. But if you have monthly data, and you said, oh I I, I estimated a model with one lag, so are you sure this is the so you need to you need to to to, to check your specification and. Uh, let's think about one rule of thumb here is th check your uh, serial correlation. Do you have serial correlation or not? Think about the um, any seasonal effect, and that will depend on, again, on the frequency of your data. Do you have annual data uh, or uh, semi-annual or quarterly data or uh, monthly data? Then you need to think uh, within the context of your data as well and see which how, how many likes to include. So let's say that we're happy with R2, AR2 with two lags. What we could do with this model, we could do forecast. So we could do the same stuff that we, we do with um, uh, uh, regression. So we can use the estimated coefficient to uh, uh, forecast. Uh, these are point forecasts and these are the, um, the confidence intervals, uh, the upper and lower bands. And in that case, you could uh, f um find or forecast future values for gt plus i t here is the number of observations or the number of years so you can go out of sample so if your data end in 2000 then you can maybe forecast for 2001 okay for for the next period uh, etc and that's what we call the, the out of sample forecast and we we will probably will have um, a full lecture on economic forecast and, and we'll, we will show different methods how to do it but but for now we still can do it the same way as we did with um, with the basic regression regression when we um, uh, uh, um, estimated a model for household income and uh, sorry how, how how household income the effect of household income on um, consumption expenditure and then we said okay since we estimated the model now we can use these coefficients to estimate how much household would uh, spend on uh, consumption given that we know they're um, uh, at certain uh, level of income so we can actually make some sort of prediction or forecast how much I they would uh, spend on uh, uh, food food and this is the same exactly the same way you could uh, if you know X then you can actually make forecast about that uh, and your X's here are the uh, the the lagged values. So this is just plotting the three points that we forecast with the with the bands with the intervals, confidence intervals. Uh, so these blue dots here are the future values that are forecast used uh, using the same uh, the same model. So this is the AR del model. S sorry, this is the AR model. So the uh, autoregressive model. So what do you mean by autoregression or autoregressive model? So yt, or the variable, is regressed on itself in the past. So how many lags to go back? So that depends on the information criteria, the serial correlation, whether you still you get rid of the serial correlation or not, and then the frequency of your data, and whether or not you, you worry about the seasonal effect that from past year. Okay? So these are things you need to think about. Okay? So with the distributed lag model, you could do the same with um, with X's with the in, uh, in, 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 in the previous example with AR we actually regressed YT on itself okay but in in, uh, in many occasions um, also X's or the other variables that affect uh, Y it's better to include them and in economics, we usually uh, express equilibrium as a static uh, uh, form, in a static form, which is not necessarily the case. We always know that, okay, the price is set when quantity supply equal quantity demand. But this is not the case all the time. Sometimes you have surplus, sometimes you have shortage. So sometimes quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded, sometimes the other way around. But then 
this will be some sort of uh, 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 the equilibrium is not going to happen instantaneously and there will be a sort of process of trial and, and error and that will happen over time. So a very popular example here is the permanent income assumptions of Milton Friedman when he said, okay, so the if you think about this, that's the current uh, consumption. So your consumption this quarter will depend on your income this quarter and your income the previous quarter and the quarter before and then going back okay so basically your your consumption uh, or current consumption is a function of weighted average of quarterly income not just this year uh, not this quarter in the in the past as well okay and that's why it's called permanent income so people adjust to any change in their income so they adjust their their consumption okay accordingly so this is just an example, but this should tell you the idea here. So yt here depends on xt, so depends on x in time t in this quarter, and xt in the previous quarter. So what you spend today depends on your income today and your income the previous time uh, period or the previous period, which could be if your data is quarterly, so we talk about quarter, the previous quarter. If your data is weekly, so that means talk about last week. If your, take a, uh, if your data is monthly, then we talk about last month. So the lag here means the last period, and that period will depend on the frequency of your data. Okay? So in this case, this is exactly the same model, so we're just trying to gen generalize the idea, not just talking about income. Uh, permanent income hypothesis. So in general, okay, um, how would we interpret these coefficients? Beta uh, 0, beta 1, beta 2, up to uh, beta Q. So beta 0, which is attached to xt, so uh, the independent variable in this time, in this period, in time t, that would be the short run or the immediate impact uh, uh, multiplier. Okay, so that means a change in mean value of the dependent variable following a unity change in your in your independent variable. So that, that's exactly the same interpretation that we would give to to this beta here. So if this changed by one unit, how much this would change? But the, the, the difference now we're talking about the short run or the um, the uh, immediate impact. If you sum these together, okay, that's called well the partial sums called the intermediate multiplier. Okay. If you sum these all together, together to up to this one, that means you're talking about the long run or the total multiplier, or the total effect. Okay. So don't don't be confused with the the word multiplier; it's just the effect. Okay, so now I talk about this is the short run multiplier. I mean, this is the short run effect of a change in X today. How much it will affect Y today. Okay, that's the short run multiplier. So if you want to look at um, last uh, period, T minus 1, T minus 2, blah, blah, blah. So then just, just add these together. That will give you the effect over the last from the last three periods okay and if you want to know that the total or the long run effect which we call here the multiplier the long, long run effect so you just sum these sum these betas together okay but here the difference here you see yt with the distributed lag models yt does not depend on yt minus one it depends on xt and xt minus one okay so this is different variable, not not yt, not the same variable. With the ER process, so the variable is regressed on itself in the past. With the DL or the distributed lag model, so L the, 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 the x, uh, you see xt, so x in time t and x in time t minus 1, and it could go back many uh, lags as well. So um, this is just an example. Um, and that I think that was yeah that was unemployment 
and um, growth rates. Okay, so what I wanted to show you here, so this is the data, and I want to create the lag for unemployment. Obviously, the first observation, you lose the first observation because there's no nothing before that. So nothing before 7.3. But the first lag here means this point. The first lag here means this point. The first lag here means this point, and so on. Okay, that means uh, ut minus 1. Um, you can think of um, g the same way. Okay, this is the change. So the change between here and here. So the difference between these two. The change is the difference between two. So this one is the difference between two. It's zero. It didn't change. Okay, and so on. GL1, so again, this is the growth uh, uh, lag, the first lag. So the first lag means should be this 1.4, 2, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 0.9. Okay, so let's just show you the structure, what we mean. So lag 2, that means you lose the first two observations, and then this is 1.4. You see this is 1.4. 2, this is 2. 1.4, 1.5. So that's that's lag 2. So when I say g t minus minus 2, I know what that means. Okay? So this is just the how the data looks like. So here's the estimation. So what does this say? What does this estimation tell us? So we have unemployment rate, u t, our dependent variable depends on uh, g lag 0 means gt this time okay so the lag here is 0 okay there's an intercept okay that's that's delta or call it whatever you want but there's here lag 0 means it's time t okay lag 1 so means t minus 1 lag 2 t minus 2 lag 3 t minus 3 okay so let's see let's look at the p value this one, the first in, in time t, it's, it's it's significant. It's very small p-value. <coughs> uh, the second lag is significant. The third lag is significant at 5%. The third lag is not. Okay? But what does tell us? Again, it might be important to consider your x's or your independent variables um, in, 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 in the past, their values in the past as well, with lag as well. Okay, so it's not just about yt, yt minus 1 on yt minus 1. Also, xt could, again, xt minus 1 can have some impact on, on in yt in this, in this time period. And this is a very um, simple example that shows you that unemployment rate in time t depends on, unemployment ra uh, depends on growth rate in time t, and growth rate in time t minus 1, and in growth rate in time t minus minus two, so two lags. Maybe the third lag is not significant, but at least we know that at least two lags are significant. Okay. Um, so how would, we, how would we estimate this again? So it's the same, uh, the, the, the specification, how, how many lags to go, uh, to go back in time? So it's the same question, how many lags to go back in time with the AR process? Um, th th there's more issues here with the x's itself because um, if you go back uh, many uh, 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 many uh, terms, so that means that can create multicollinearity between these x's, okay? Because do you remember when we say growth rate this year might be correlated with growth rate um, growth rate from this quarter might be correlated with growth rate from the previous quarter, so that might create multicollinearity, and that was the main issue when we have the x's are linearly correlated you remember so that was one of the issues that we discussed uh, the week before last week okay so including these x's might create this sort of multicollinearity or you may have a very small sample that you see every time we go back in time we lose observations so when you get when you when you three lags you're losing three observations and also you need observations to uh, to estimate these parameters, okay, so you might just have very few observations or uh, if you have a very small sample, there might not be enough to do this estimation or might not be enough to get uh, a meaningful 
uh, estimation. Or you could have, not like this, this is a, a finite distributed lag, meaning that we had up to Q, so we know like we're going back two lags, three lags, six lags, five lags, but we could actually have something like this. This is an infinite distributed lag model where um, uh, not defined how many lags. So what if we can convert this or transform this to something else or somehow that we don't have really to worry about these number of lags? We don't have to worry about this large number of parameters to estimate, okay? And this is the uh, transformation, the correct transformation that can actually, or actually does this. So what it does, assuming that these betas have the same coefficient and they decline as you go back in time, so that means the effect of this is on, 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 on yt is smaller than this, this is smaller than this and smaller than this and, and, and so on. So you could actually convert this in that way. So um, if they have the same sign as we said and they decline uh, geometrically, so that means you could have the beta k, so the total, should be uh, could be equal beta naught times lambda. Lambda here uh, is a value between uh, 0 and 1, and it's called the rate of decay, okay? How much it, it goes, it, it becomes smaller every time. And 1 minus lambda, in this case, is called speed of adjustment, okay? How fast or how quick the um, yt, your dependent variable, adjusts to changes in your independent uh, 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 variable. And in that case, the value of this beta k here depends on these two things and on beta naught and 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 um sorry and uh, and lambda okay so as we said this this value here this lambda will be between two values 0 and 1 okay so if this close to 0 so that means this declines slowly so it's very slow okay and that means the x values in distant past have some impact on yt the other case, if this lambda is close to zero, so it's very small, so that means the impact of x in distant past have little uh, impact on, on, on yt. So it depends on really on the value of this lambda. But what we know here is that, okay, so this one minus lambda is the speed of adjustment. The, uh, again, what do we mean by the speed of adjustment? Is that how fast y adjusts to changes in, 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 in x? So if we talk about consumption and income in a time series context, or, so or if we talk about the same uh, um, uh, example we give now when we talk about unemployment rate and growth rate, okay? So how fast unemployment rate adjusts to uh, growth rate or changes in uh, or new levels in growth rate? Um <coughs> So that's exactly, w that's what we said. So this should be smaller as you go back in, in, in time. And using this, we could actually transform this equation. Remember, that's the question I asked. If we have this sort of um, infinite number of parameters to estimate, if we can change this to this, this is exactly what the uh, correct transformation does. It changes that to this model. See the difference between this model with infinite number of parameters to estimate into this model, which has only how many parameters to estimate here? Three, okay? So in that case, you have, we still have this, this is the speed of adjustment, we know that. And this is the, you know what this is, is again, the uh, 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 immediate effect or the beta naught. But this process now became AR process. You remember yt depends on yt minus 1 and xt. Okay? So infinite, uh, rather than having infinite number of parameters to estimate as is the case in this model, we have only another model where we can actually have 
only three parameters to, to estimate. Okay, so that's how we transform this uh, distributed lag model, infinite distributed lag model, so where you can have uh, a large number or infinite number, sorry, of um, uh, lags in, in, in the x or with the x, xt minus 1, xt minus 2, and then go back uh, infinite number of lags. How to convert this, how to transform this into uh, a, an AR process, um, and that will save you really having to deal with all these number of parameters um, uh, and, and reduce the number of parameters needed estimation into uh, three units. So please, um, do you have any question about these two processes now? So we talk about the AR process and the DL, the distributed lag models. Can you please look at Socrative now and, and answer question number four and number five? Because as usual, if you don't have question to ask, then I have questions to ask you. So it's your turn now to, ask to, to answer my questions. So please go on Socrative and answer question number four and five. And then you have a break. So your break is conditioned on answering the questions. So and I'm going to look at the screen now. Only those who answer the question will have a break. <laughs> Okay, Dan, you have one more question to go. One more question to go for the break. Okay, guys, let's have 10 minutes break, and then we come back to um, move to the next so part of the lecture. We talked about uh, AR process and distributed lag uh, models, and now we, we learn how to convert this to, um, and this could be converted to ARDL, AR where we have the autoregressive part so we have yt, so we, can't like we could have a more general case now where we have yt depends on yt with lags here. So it is regressed on itself. So the first part is, is our AR process. The second part here is the distributed lag process, and that model is called ARDL. So autoregressive distributed lag model, so because it, it includes both. It includes um, yt in, in lagged values and then uh, um, and also uh, the x as well. So this obviously captures the dynamics of both. So that's more general compared to the one that we uh, saw in the previous uh, in the first half of the lecture. So that that captures both the dynamics of of y and the dynamics of uh, the dynamics of lagged y's and the dynamics of lagged uh, X um, and of course can uh, eliminate autocorrelation because you could uh, include um, the uh, the lags values. So let's let's have a look at some example. This is a very simple example, a very simple example of um, inflation. Okay, so inflation rate in time t depends on inflation rate in time t minus 1 so th remember that's y t minus 1 and that depends on an employment rate in time t and an employment rate in time t minus 1 so this is a very simple ARDL model we have one lag one p equal 1 or the uh, the the number of lags for the um, y is only 1 and we have one lag for x, so it's 1, 1. So AR del 1, 1, so P equal 1 and Q equal 1. So that means one lag for the dependent variable uh, for y and one lag for, uh, for x. So estimating this model, um, that gave us, these are the estimate, uh, estimated coefficients. This is the, uh, the, f the, the yt minus 1 or inflation in time t minus 1, and this is uh, u, or the change in unemployment rate in time t, and this is the change in unemployment rate in time t minus 1. So L here is just the lag operator, rather than saying t minus 1, I just added L, this is the difference uh, operator, so um, that means is the, uh, the, the first difference, so is the, the change. Um, 
Yeah, and you see these all significant again. So the difference here, or the comparing this to what we covered earlier, you've got both in the model. So you have yt minus 1, which is inflation t minus 1, and xt and xt minus 1, which is the change in unemployment rate in, in time t, and t uh, minus 1. Okay, so this is more general case where uh, we have both in the model, so the AR process and the DL or distributed lags, and that was a very, very simple example. So this is the first, really, the first topic I wanted to cover today, just to introduce you to um, some examples of dynamic models where you can uh, include either lags of Y or lags of X, or you have both together in one model. So you could have AR model, okay? So the autoregressive model where you have yt depends on yt minus 1, yt minus up to yt minus p. Or you could have the distributed lag where you have yt depends on xt and xt minus 1 and xt go back up to q. Uh, or you could have the ARD model where you have both. You have uh, yt depends on yt minus 1 up to p, yt minus p plus xt plus xt minus 1 going back to xt minus, uh, minus q plus an error term, which is the ARD model. So these are the examples I wanted to look at uh, quickly in this or briefly in this lecture. Now I want to cover the second point or the second half of this lecture. I want to talk about stationarity. And uh, this is one of the very important, uh, if not the most important, uh, uh, thing to look at or to, 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 to check in your, in your data once since you, de you deal with um, time series data. So it's very important to, to check the uh, properties of your data. So as a, as a general definition, what that means, the stationarity means, first we need to think of what a time series is. So a time series is uh, an example of a stochastic process, which means it's a sequence of random variables ordered uh, in time. Um, and the main issue here is that when we run regression on time series, we um, the regression uh, this assumes that these time series are stationary, which means they <coughs> have constant mean, constant uh, variance, and the covariance depends only on the distance between two periods, not on time itself. So if a time series satisfies this condition, so it is called weakly stationary, okay, and this is something we shouldn't worry about if that's the case. But in reality, this is not the case. So with most time series data you deal with, this is not, this assumptions or this, these properties are not, uh, are not true with most economic and financial time series, okay? So again, so in regression we assume it is stationary, but the case or the real case is not, it's not stationary. Uh, what do you mean by stationary? Again, these three conditions, remember the constant mean, constant variance, and the covariance depends only on the distance between two periods, not on time. And the problem is that these conditions or these uh, are not true in most of economic and financial uh, 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 series, and that's why they're called non-stationary. Okay? So, most of the series you will be dealing with will be, so the normal is to be non-stationary. Some of them will be stationary in level, that's fine. But what I'm saying here is that in general, the majority of the time series data we'll deal with uh, uh, are likely to be uh, non-stationary. So what's the problem? Okay, we, we said when we, when, we, when we run regression on a time series uh, data, we assume stationarity. So what if... Uh, the, the data are not stationary. What if we run regression um, and the data is not stationary? So what was the problem here? Well, the main problem here is that you are likely to have, you could have uh, what we call a spurious regression or a regression that is not meaningful. Meaning you could have run a regression between two variables that has no relationship at all. They're not correlated at all. Okay, and your regression give you amazing results. 
They actually, they are, stati there's statistically a significant relationship between both variables. Wow, and you generally say, oh, that's impressive. I found it, and now I, 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 f I figure out why, or what the main um, reason um, of growth, for example, in, in country X. So if you run, if you run a regression between uh, maybe your height over years and GDP of your country, you might find significant relationship, but does that make sense? So as you go taller, your, <laughs> your, your, your country <laughs> uh, economic growth, uh, no, it doesn't. It's not, they're not related, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, that's what, we, what, that's what we mean by spurious regression. So you have a strong relationship, statistically proven, you see it, but between two variables that they are not related at all. Okay, and there's no way they are related. And I'll show you an example now. Okay, so uh, one of these silly examples, I think there's, uh, uh, I could send you the link to an, a large number of, uh, many number of uh, examples of uh, researchers actually did that. They collected data, just for fun, yeah? They collected data between variables that there's no way they are correlated, there's no relationship between them, okay? Like uh, uh, infant mortality rate in X country and GDP growth in another country. Something like unbelievable, okay? You can see like, you see and they are, oh wow, they're statistically <laughs> related. No, it's not. It's just because both variables have upward trend or down tr downward trend, so they, they change over time. And that, that's, this is why the regression gives you some uh, uh, sort of correlation between, showing correlation between both, okay? It's just because of the nature of the series, both series uh, move uh, upward or downwards, they have some, some trend over time. Your height change over time and growth change over time. Okay, so this doesn't make them related in any in anyhow or any I, I don't know why, but anyway, so in that case, you could have a statistically significant coefficient, high R square, very impressive results between two, two variables that they no way uh, are correlated. So this is um, um, just to show you an example. So I tried to create some data, and to do this, I just um, I'll show you the code how to create this data. I followed like an AR process, which means um, yt depends on yt minus one, and draw here uh, 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 if, so this is AR1, meaning I just want uh, only one lag, yt minus one, and some uh, uh, random error. And then I created some, some data here. These are artificially generated, okay? So these are not real data. Just to show you the difference between a stationary series and you see non-stationary series. You see this is this have like upward trend. This is not non this is not stationary, this is not stationary. So these sort of time you see it's going up and down around the same mean, so constant mean, and kind of the, the way it's spread around that mean seems to be equal. Okay? So it seems to be more stationary data. But most series you will deal with will look like this, all this, okay? So this one, you see, just going up and down around the constant mean and the variance or how, how, how much they spread around that mean um, seems to be equal. So going to the idea of the spurious regression, I created another variable, generated another variable, two random variables. These has, no, has nothing to do with each other. I just plot them. And here's the um, scatter plot of both variables. And guess what? I'm going to run regression between these two. Wow, statistically significant. You see the coefficient, the estimated coefficient? X has statistically significant relationship with Y. So I created the variable and I know they have nothing to do with each other. They're not correlated at all, okay? It's just the way they evolve over time the series itself, it seems they are, but they are not, okay? It's just the way they change over time, okay? But I they have nothing to do with each other, okay? So these are uncorrelated, they should have no relationship, even though when you run a regression between two variables that they are not correlated at all, 
because they are non-stationary, they're not stationary data uh, series, that's why you see there is a significant relationship between X and Y, and it's very, it's highly significant, okay? So it's very highly significant, which is, uh, which is not, uh, which is not true. We know that it's not, it's not true. Okay, so this is the this is the idea here. So again, just before jumping to the next point. Okay, so first we assume stationarity or regression. Assume that the series are stationary, and what that means. What that means. Constant mean, constant variance, and the covariance depend <laughs> on the distance between two points not in time. Okay. So, in reality, most time series data you'll deal with are non-stationary. I didn't say all, but at least most of them will be non-stationary. Okay. So, what is the problem? The main problem here is the spurious regression, or the regression that is not meaningful or meaningless regression that doesn't mean anything. anything. Okay. Remember the example about your height and growth rate. Okay, don't know how you can relate these to each other, but in regression, in a regression model, you might find a significant relationship between both. Uh, the example we show here, we just generated data that are not related for two series, and then um, uh, and then we find significant relationships. So that's that's an example of uh, spurious regression. So now, how do we know? that a series is, whether a series is stationary or not, okay? You could plot the series and look at the series, whether it has trend, does it look like very stationary, like the first one is very straightforward, but in all cases, in time series data or any in your regression, you, you should know your data, you should um, uh, look at the descriptive statistics or the summer statistics, you should plot your data, that's like ABC regression or dealing with data anyway. But in addition to that, you need to test, formally test whether you have uh, your data is a stationary or not. And the test that does that is a Dickey-Fuller test. And the test is very simple. Um, you have yt depends on rho, uh, yt minus, uh, minus one plus some error. And the null hypothesis here that the data is not stationary or has a unit root, meaning that this row equal one. So if this row equal one, okay, that means the data isn't stationary. The data has what we call a unit root. Um, if a row is less than one, that means the data is, your series is, is a stationary. For the test purposes, Actually, it looks at the change rather than yt, so it's change in yt. Okay, so this comes from this one by just say yt minus yt minus one, and then that can take you to this form. In this case, you have three forms of the test. The first one, which we call the random walk form. The second one is a random walk with drift. You have this alpha, and the other one, uh, you have it with uh, deterministic uh, trend. So you still have with drift and so with alpha and with t. t here is the trend, okay? So you have three, <coughs> three forms of the test, and when you run the test, you need to specify which, which form you're looking at. Uh, the, the, the only difference is the critical value because they all have the same as the same null hypothesis and the same alternative hypothesis. In this case, because we transform this to this equation, not this one, because we have here delta yt, not yt. So that means gamma here, which is this coefficient, equals zero. So that means the data is not stationary or uh, uh, it has a unit root. If gamma is less than one, this is the alternative. Uh, and that means the data is, or the your series is stationary, okay? So, as I said, this is exactly what I said. So if you reject the null hypothesis, if you reject the null hypothesis, 
that means your data is stationary. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means your data is not stationary. Um, the difference here that this test doesn't follow T, uh, T distribution or T test, so you can't you can't run this regression. Uh, you do actually run this regression using OLS, that's fine, but you can't do the t-test based on the t-distribution. So what you have here, you take the test statistic, and then you compare this with critical values that are produced by simulation that are provided by um, uh, DKM Fuller, and they call this all a statistic, uh, or this test, tau uh, test, and they provide their own critical values. And most softwares give, this you, give you these uh, critical values, so you don't have really to worry about uh, how to generate or how to obtain these these uh, critical values. So the idea here, okay, in the usual way, so if you have the computed uh, tau or t greater than in absolute value, so greater than the critical value, then you reject the null hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? What's the null hypothesis in dickey fuller test? Yeah, so which means it's not stationary. Yes, okay. So, <coughs> so you reject this null hypothesis if the computed uh, statistic are uh, greater than the critical value or if you have a very small p-value smaller than um, the significance level, let's say, of 5% or 1%. So if you have a smaller value, then you reject the null hypothesis and that means, again, uh, non-stationary uh, 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 series. And as I said, these three forms with uh, random walk, random walk with drift, random walk with drift, and time trend, they all have the same uh, null hypothesis, but they have different critical values. Okay? So, but in all cases, as I said, most softwares, including R, they produce this uh, for you. And also, they produce the p-value, so you could just look at the p-value and decide based on, on the p-value uh, provided. This is, the, this is an example of the test. Um, I did this on, um, I think, the US uh, GDB data, if I remember. Yeah, well, it's, it's US serious anyway, but I think it's, uh, it's the growth rate. I'm not sure if that was the growth rate or the unemployment rate, but one of the two variables that we um, we did, and the as I said, this is the test statistic that's produced by R, and as usual, I'll produce, I'll record a video to show you how to reproduce all these tables and graphs and 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 test as well. Um, but at the end, you could look at this. Okay. So if you if you fail to reject, that means that the data is not stationary. So your data has a U series here has a unit root or non-stationary because you cannot reject uh, this. So if you fail to reject, that means the data is not stationary. And obviously, when you look at at the data, it doesn't really look going up and down around uh, a, a constant uh, a constant mean at all. It's actually having a kind of trend here. So, uh, so it's obviously it's not it's not stationary, uh, it's not st stationary series. Okay. Um, so you could actually the augmented Dickey Fuller test um, add different lags or more lags. So if you look at the Dickey Fuller test, what we have here we have <coughs> we have the change in yt delta yt. And here we have only yt minus 1. So we have AR1 process, or we go back in time only one lag only in time. Okay? But with the augmented test, you could actually add. So this is the same. That's exactly the same test, the same t equation. Okay? But with the augmented Dickey Fuller, we add more lagged value of the dependent variable. Okay? So you could go back in time here. T minus uh, T equal one, so starting from one up to uh, up to M. M here could be the 
the maximum lag uh, lag length of of the dependent uh, dependent variable. Okay, so how do we deal with the stationarity? So let's now know we knew now that this series is not stationary. We um, we couldn't reject the null hypothesis, so it is not stationary. It has unit root. So and we know if we use this series to do a regression, we are worried about spurious regression or the regression that is not meaningful. So what should we do? Okay, one way you could make the series stationary. So a non-stationary series could be converted to a stationary series. Okay, and there are ways to do that. One way is if we have a trend stationary, what we call the trend stationary. So if the series has, let's say, upward trend, okay, so it has a trend that seems non-stationary data or non-stationary series. However, it goes up and down around that trend, okay, we could, what we call, we could do what we call take out that trend and that will transform the series to be stationary which we call detrend the series. How, and in this case, the series actually is called trend stationary. So because it is stationary around that trend, so it goes up and down, not around its constant mean, it goes actually up and down around that upward trend. So if you detrend the data, if you take that trend away, if you filter the data, if you filter the trend, you take it out, then the result uh, will be a stationary series and that's exactly what it means uh, trend stationary so in this case trend stationary so you have yt and this is your 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 trend so it goes up and down around that trend so if you run this regression and you obtain the residuals from here these residuals will be your detrended series so after taking out that trend okay so what is left here of your series, which is the hat here represent the, the residuals. That means these are your retrended uh, data. And if your series is a trend stationary, that means once you detrend it, once you remove that trend away, then uh, then you get a stationary um, a stationary time series. How about what if your data is not a trend stationary? Why? What if it is not going up around um, a trend, okay? In that case, you could difference the data. So take the first difference or the second difference. Depends how many times you go back. You have to difference the data, sorry. So if a series becomes stationary, so you could take the first difference and do um, the test again or plot the data and do the test again. If that change the data to be uh, stationary, that means your data is um, uh, integrated of order one, okay? So if I have to, if they have a series that I need to difference once, so if I have a non-stationary uh, series that I need to difference once to become a stationary, that means the series is integrated of order one or it's called I1. If I have a series that I need to difference twice so i took the first difference and then i difference it again and then it became only stationary after i difference it twice that means the data or the series is integrated of order two and and so on so it depends on if if you difference d times that means your data or your series is uh, integrated of order d and uh, the good news is most of the series you will have, you will deal with, it's mainly I1, okay? There are some rare cases of I2, but mostly will be I1, which, which means you difference it once, you take the first difference, and then that will convert the series to into a stationary or a non-stationary series to a stationary series. How about if the, the series was in level stationary? That means it's integrated of order zero because you don't need to difference it to make it stationary because it is actually stationary okay so if it was a stationary if, if your series is stationary in level without any differencing that means it's integrated of order zero and it's a stationary uh, stationary uh, series 
So this is very important, as I said. With I0, with the stationary uh, data, uh, the series will fluctuate, so go up and down around a constant mean. So it's exactly that way. Look at the first graph here. This is exactly what it means. This is I0, this is a stationary series, so it's going up and down around um, a constant mean and the variance, so the way how much it's spread around uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the mean seems to be uh, constant. So, um, so that's the idea. So it's that's why they call it re mean reverting. So it goes away and come back. Goes away and come back. Goes up and down around the mean. That's why they call it uh, 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 mean reverting. But I1 or non-stationary data doesn't show that. It's like sometimes had upward trend or downward trend. It doesn't really show this sort of behavior going up and down around. Um, so as I said, most of uh, of, of non-stationary data, or most of um, economic data that are non-stationary, so they are I1. So, um, so mostly you will have to difference it only once. In some rare cases, you have to do it twice to make it stationary. So, what do you mean by stationary? <laughs> yes. Okay. So what is the problem with dealing with running regression with non-stationary uh, series? I want an answer from this side. So what is the problem? Why, why are we worried about this? Why, am, why, why, why do I have to talk about this for an hour? Just give me one reason to give this lecture. Yes? I hear something from this side, but I, I want some, someone from this side to tell me. What's the problem if, uh, if you run regression with non-stationary series? Come on, we, we want to finish this lecture. We're not going to leave this room without answering this question. So what is the problem? Yes. Come on, it's sweet. <laughs> okay, in the back. Come on, you're my last hope. <laughs> we want to finish the lecture. <laughs> so the problem when you run regression of non-stationary series. Yes, thank you. You're the only one who answered my questions. I don't know why, why they're not happy with me, so they don't talk to me. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so at least we get an answer. So don't worry, we'll leave the room soon. Okay, so please go. This is just uh, an example of the, guys, just 30 seconds and you'll go. But if you keep talking, that means you'll make it longer. So, yeah. So it's better to be quiet now for 30 seconds and go rather than staying for another 10 minutes. Okay? Great. Remember this? This series here, it was not stationary. And then, and, 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 and the p-value here was large, so we couldn't reject the null hypothesis. So when I difference this series here, it becomes, you see, going up and down, kind of constant mean here. And I think I did the, yeah, and I did the test here. And then a small b-value, you reject the null hypothesis. That means it became stationary. So you see this, this one is the differenced one. So I plot the series after I difference it, and now it looks, if you compare this to this one, so this is the series, this is the original one. So after I difference it, I obtain the new series, this one. And this one looks more stationary. Now it's going up and down around this constant mean, and when I did the test, the p-value is very small here, smaller than uh, 5%. That means I reject the null hypothesis, so when you reject the null hypothesis with the ADF uh, test, that means your series is a stationary. Okay? And that's what we wanted here to do here. Okay. So uh, just to conclude the lecture, we covered the some examples of dynamic models. We compared uh, between stationary and non-stationary series. We know what are the implications or the consequences of dealing with stationary series and how to convert a stationary series, a sta a non-stationary series into
into a stationary series. And then uh, next time we'll talk about VAR and VEC model, vector uh, autoregressive models and um, error correction model. Uh, do you have any questions? If you don't have any questions, then answer my questions before you go, please. So please don't go without uh, rating the lecture. Tell me what you like, what you wish to change in the lecture. And please be a bit more specific if you want to change something. If you want me to repeat something, if you want me to explain something in more detail, anything you want, just put it, just give me more detail about what you really want, okay? And if you don't want to put it in uh, on this survey, just email me or come and uh, talk to me during the office hour. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for uh, being quiet when I asked you to be quiet, okay? And uh, I'll, I'll see you at the computer lab. Thank you so much. Thank you.